Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and Independent Photo Imagers. Hello again, and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by G. Ranasena, the CEO of Kexino. And he's coming to us from France today. Hi, G. How are you today? I'm doing very well, Gary. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm very pleased to be here. You're a marketing expert, and that's really what we're going to talk about. But as we were chatting in the preamble, you actually started with medium and large format photography, and you still have a deep abiding love for that. Tell us a little bit about that. Let's start. Yeah, that, that's that, that's exactly right. I uh, I studied photography at um, college and university, and ran a production company for five years. Um, primarily large large format studio based stuff. There were three of us at the end, and um, we, we did, it was mainly ag- agency work, um, advertising, billboards. Got one. One point was I was able to direct a TV commercial, which was pretty exciting for me. Mm-hmm. At that time, sounds like fun uh, for for Nestle. Um, and um, otherwise, I, yeah, I, I lived behind the inverted ground glass screen of a Cinar four by five or eight by ten with uh, bronze color lighting, and uh, that's that was my home. Um, mm. I uh, I got involved with digital image capture right at the very beginning, so I have uh, uh, intimate knowledge with. Uh, image capture systems from what was then called um, Leaf. Well, I think they're called something yes. else now. Yeah. Um, also a company called Dicomed. Oh, my um, gosh. You're bringing back I'm bringing back memories, memories now. now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I worked worked very closely with Dicomed a number of times. And uh, phase one for the scanning backs at one point in time as well. And um, got into digital image capture right at the very beginning. I think we were the first the first reseller of the original Kodak DCS um, modified DSLR uh, digital cam- camera back. Uh, well, I think we sold the first one in Europe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Way back in the um, for early to mid nineties, I think it was. So yeah, I, I I I cut my teeth on photography, so I'm, I'm I I know the difference between the Scheinflug principle and the inverse square law. <laughs> and you way. can do it upside down with the uh, and absolutely looking in a glass, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, absolutely. Wow, that was a crazy time. That transition period. Um, I didn't actually. I didn't know that. We didn't. So I'm kind of interested in kind of your thoughts about you know, being a professional with these skills of, you know, I mean, obviously working with large format, there's a lot of technical skill required, right? You're not just a happy snapper guy. There's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, not need to know about exposure and composition and those kind of things. And then you see digital coming in and all the, and in the early days, all the flaws with it, right? I mean, capture backs are nearly like what they are now in terms of resolution and, you know, color matching and all of those fine things. What were your thoughts when you saw them coming in? Obviously you were excited. You became a dealer, right? And you, you kind of did that, but did you think it was going to get where it is now, I guess, in terms of, uh, did you have that sort of anticipation? And is that why you eventually got out? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, th- I think, I think I, I, in the early days, I mean, f- firstly, I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation around, what is and is not possible with digital image capture, and sure, sure. too too often, especially um, uh, people in the phot- photographic industry who've been brought up on film, they they can conf- they conflate scanning resolution with output resolution, right? Um, and you know, in the early nineties, I was doing forty eight sheet posters from a twelve megapixel camera back. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Um, because the capture resolution and the bit depth that we we're capturing, I mean, sure, that we would talk about interpolation to get it up there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it only made sense for particular types of, of, of images, right? Because obviously, you, you know, especially if you're using, you know, vignettes, gradients, that sort of thing, interpolation, especially during those years, wasn't exactly, you know, cutting edge. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think the biggest shock has been the death of the point and shoot. Mm-hmm, sure. Right? You know, um, you know, we, we had, we still got, we still got today, right? We've got professional level cameras where you've got, you know, large 
mm-hmm. uh, large sensor arrays going on the back of um, view cameras or medium format cameras, and then mm-hmm. you've got high resolution uh, mirrorless. Well, still got DSLRs, I suppose, but you know, mirrorless is definitely where we're, what we're talking about today. And then, of course, you've got phones, right? Um, and that middle ground has sort of disappeared. Sure. You know, no, yep. Nobody buys that, you know, point point and shoot type camera anymore. Right. Um, and I, I, I think what really surprised me was how quickly the, in inverted commas, good enough resolution right. came around. Yeah. You know, even even for phones. Right. Right. But, you know, especially for, let's call it, what, professional quality imaging. Right. When, and I think that was mainly to do with bit depth rather than actual resolution. You know, sure. The the ability not just capture but actually output raw to allow people to start playing around with, you know, greater than sixteen bit color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, and that's the thing is like you said, resolution is one piece, right? And then there's right. all the other color science and other stuff built in around it, right? That absolutely that, sure. that, that you know the human eye perceives. It's more than just resolution. That's super interesting because that's that was a period that you know when, when I was living through that in my PMA days, there was some a lot of assumptions made in the industry, right, related to what how consumers would behave, and you know where the profit centers could be. Like people used to think I can make money off digital cameras, right, um, and you know you can, but not any, but only in the like like you said. Uh, system cameras or higher end cameras, a point and shoot, you can't make any money on because, you know, you're basically competing, competing against a device, i.e. a cell phone that, you know, carriers are subsidizing. You're basically, people are buying a $700 phone or a camera every year, practically through their carrier. So it's a whole different economic model. When you look back at that part of your career, what made you move on, right? When did you, when did you move on? uh, And, and what was your thought process on that? Well, I, I got I got involved with these people, you know, Leaf, Dicomed, and these yeah, sorts yeah. of guys because I was that rare breed of a film photographer who understood a little bit about digital. And, and what these manufacturers screwed up on, to be honest, sure, was they figured that selling digital camera backs was something they needed to go to for photographers mm-hmm. or you know studios, catalog catalog photography companies, you know, which are like sort of basically their. Um, they're like farms, aren't they? They've got like 20 sets, uh, room sets, which are built. And then, you know, there's there's a con- consistent um, set builders knocking down and rebuilding sets as they're doing different catalog shoots, those sorts of sure, things. Sure, sure. Um, but there, there wasn't anybody... The, the problem with selling digital ca- uh, cameras to photographers in those days was that, okay, the lighting was the same, exposure pretty much the same, you know, mm-hmm. composition, uh, perspective, optics, depth of field, all of that sort of stuff was the same. You'd capture the image, create this RGB file, and then the photographer said, well, now what? Right. Right? Um, and, and and you'd be surprised at this, Carrie. Or maybe you wouldn't because, you know, from your PMA days. But one of the stock answers from certain hardware manufacturers of the time was, well, what you can do is give that file to your local photo lab who'll create a transparency for you. <laughs> right the old the old film right. recorders were, were yes were a big yeah, the, Fi- the fire 1000 is the one i remember i don't know that i don't know if those com- that, that company is still around but the fire 1000 could create that absolutely stunning 8 by 10 transparency right. um from a digital file at which point you then scan it again right? <laughs> but that 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 was the answer for a more you know more than one manufacturer at the time Right. So what these manufacturers realise is that, okay, the real um, beneficiaries of digital image capture wasn't so much the photographers. Mm. It was everything that happened post-transparency. Right. Right? Because if you speak to what was then called pre-press, pre-media companies or printing companies or mm-hmm. ad agencies, retouchers, you know, what, 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 whatever company was in the value chain, getting up to the final product. Sure. They dealt with scanned data all day, every day. It was scanned transparencies. Sure. But they they knew what they were doing with an RGB file. They'd right. Put it, they'd put it into, you know, 
Photoshop 2.0 or Quantel Paintbox or <laughs> Crossfield wow. Mamba or um, Go, Dicomed Imaginator. Throwing down memory lanes of software there. Anyway. Right. All, all, all of those, all that good stuff back in the day, right, which I'm guessing most of your listeners wouldn't have even heard of, these, these sorts of things. They probably weren't around. But they would use those, and they understood what was going on. Mm. So what these manufacturers were looking for is somebody who understood both sides of the fence, the image capture side, but mm. also things like not just color management, but color conversions. Right. Because if, you go, if you're going to press, if you're going to ink on paper, mm-hmm. you're in the world of CMYK, you're in the world of four color. You're no longer dealing with transmissive light model, color model, you're dealing with the refres- reflectance color model, right? right. Um, it's a whole different set of headaches. Sure. Um, and you've got, you know, restricted gamut and you've got, you know, there's... there's uh, Loads of things with color separations that you need to worry about. And when you get into mm-hmm. the printing sure. process, you've got um, another set of color separations. You've got things like undercolor removal, dot gain, gray component replacement, all of this really cool stuff that nobody understands unless you're a printer. And there wasn't anybody who could span those two disciplines. Mm-hmm. Enter G, stage left, mm-hmm. um, as the as who was volunteered to get up to speed. So what happened was um, I got involved with... Um, printing, pre-media, retouching, that whole world. Mm-hmm. Um, as the digital image capture person who understood what was going on. And one of the companies I was working with um, had other products apart from digital ca- uh, image capture systems. Mm-hmm. And they were pre-press software. They were really high-end workstations by companies a company that, uh, that was very worked very closely with a company called Silicon Graphics, for example. Mm-hmm. Which no, I remember those folks well too. Yeah, the, uh, in the in the same way, they uh, actually their old building is where Google now lives in Mountain View, California. Okay, um, and uh, that's how I, I migrated away from photography into the world of print and publishing and started getting involved in those sort of systems. So it wasn't really a divorce Mm -hmm. as such. I didn't sort of really quit. Right. I just sort of evolved really and just got further and further away. So yeah, that's, 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 that's the history of my uh, photographic side of things. But that's, you know, it's fascinating because it is sort of, uh, like you said, it's more of an evolution. What happened there? Some of it was driven by technology. Some was driven by the market, right? A lot of it was driven by the technology, I should say. But yes. you know, there still had to be an application for it. You know, you and I have seen things over the years. I'm sure that was a great technology, and there was no application for it, right? You know, absolutely. Like like we were talking a little bit before the show about you know TVs and you know 3D movies, right? Great technology, not great for actually making movies. So. So, yeah, so let's move on because I really wanted to have you on to talk about marketing because you're very much a pragmatic sort of uh, marketer. So talk a little bit about like, you know, getting starting your business what and, and what you focus on in marketing before we get into the nuts and bolts piece of it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Photo retailers, energize your sales with Share Me Chat, the proven texting platform. Using chat-to-text on your website keeps your customers connected and buying. See us at Pro and IPI to find out why dealers using ShareMeChat close more sales without adding staff. Find out more at ShareMe.chat. So today, my my new life, if you like... Mm -hmm. Um, is uh, Kixino, which is a marketing agency specifically targeted towards startups and small businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been uh, we've been going since two thousand and eight, mm-hmm. which is you know this make, make, uh, we would actually just last month we turned sixteen years. Nice, so you um, get your driver's license. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in that time, we've helped uh, just about four hundred or so startups and small to medium sized businesses sure. um, with, you know, implementing marketing strategy, branding, design, you know, mm-hmm. website development, SEO, copywriting, all of that sort of stuff. Sure. Um, we even became software developers ourselves with a launch of a, a, a kind of SaaS, which was a solution to manage and control brand language assets mm-hmm. out of language. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also for the past 10 years, like you, I'm a teacher. 
Mm -hmm. I've been teaching marketing and behavioral economics to uh, mm -hmm. to final year MB stu MBA students at uh, at two different business schools. From a um, services perspective, to be honest, I'm not really interested in the in in the services aspect because. You know, we're a marketing agency. We're as good or as bad as any other marketing agencies because we're all doing the same thing in terms of services. The tactical right. execution, to be honest, is the easy bit, right? right. Every marketing agency has similar tactical capabilities. It's, right. it's, it's table stakes, right? It's it's the stuff that uh, tactics is the stuff that comes out at the end. For me, what's what's more interesting and certainly what's more important is the stuff that comes beforehand. Right. And by that, I mean sitting down and taking the time to understand the client business. The, you know, the customer buying behaviors, mm -hmm. the segmentation, targeting, messaging, all the stuff that unfortunately very few marketers or marketing agencies bother with today. <laughs> right. Unfortunately. Yeah. Right? Or or your small businesses think they need. Uh, in well, terms I, I, the of thing like, is, I need a TikTok, right? Or I need an right. Instagram. Yeah. The, this, this comes under the, gen, the general heading, Gary, for me, of. Um, this comes down to self-diagnosing. Right. And self-diagnosing is a very, very dangerous thing. Mm. Right. And let me give an example of self self-diagnosis. So if if I get up one morning mm -hmm. and I feel like I've got a pain in my chest, mm -hmm. right? A really painful pain in my chest mm -hmm. to the point where I need to go to the emergency room. Right. Okay. Now I may I may have scanned WebMD or something else on the internet on the way there, right? I'm not a doctor, okay. I don't have an MD. I'm not a qualified cardiologist, right? Right. So the last thing I'm I do when I go to the ER is tell the attending, um, I've got angina. You need to give me angina medication. Right. Right. That's not my job. Right. My job is to tell the physician my symptoms. Mm -hmm. Right, it hurts when I do this. When did it start hurting? What right. kind of pain is it? Um, do you have any uh, underlying uh, medical issues? Sure. Right, and then the physician will probably run some tests, take a bit of blood, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe take a bit of various other bits and pieces, which may not be as as pleasant. And then after a few hours, they'll come back and they'll say to me, "Okay, well, based upon my professional opinion." based upon, you know, years of med school, years of being a junior doctor and years of actually working at this EME, um, what you actually have is gas, right? <laughs> right? You've overdone it on the spicy food yesterday. Right. And that pain that you've got mm -hmm. is gas. You don't have angina. Right. You don't need angina medication. You need some Tums. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Now, this is the danger of self-diagnosis sure. so when a business owner comes to us and says i need this mm -hmm. i need a new website i need a social media presence i need and no no you don't need because you don't know what you need right you just think you know what you need based upon the last person you spoke with right 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 it's your job is to tell the professional that you're engaging with mm -hmm what the problem is, mm -hmm. what the ideal outcome is, mm -hmm. and then your contractor, mm -hmm. your services provider, outlines a plan of how they think is the best way to get there, right? You don't yeah. go to a garage and say, I need a new transmission, mm -hmm. when all you need is a new oil change. Right. 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 It, you're, you're, you're putting your trust in someone mm -hmm. who does this for a living. Mm -hmm. right? right it's their job to do this sort of stuff right so if you and, come and, and if say, they don't do it well they won't be a business much right. longer right now if they don't do it well right then you know they can only they can only live or live or uh or die by their their own mm -hmm. their, their their own work that's that's a different matter there's pl there's plenty of sucky contractors out there right sure. there's plenty of cowboys who do uh plumbing or roofing or whatever Right. That that's in that's in any industry, right. inclu in, including the photo retail industry. Right. 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 But if if you're in entrusting uh, your your problem into the hands of an expert or so a certain someone who's got more experience in their particular area of expertise than you have, right. 
then it's not up to you to self-diagnose because right. you do not know what you do not know. Because, mm -hmm. you know, powerful. it's interesting you say that because um, uh, when I talk to my students that I, in my entrepreneurship students, there's one thing I talk about is, you know, get help for the things that, you, you know, you didn't get in business to do the books unless you're being a CPA, right? But if you're running exactly. A, you know, a food truck or something like that. That's why you got in the business. You didn't get in the business to, you know, be be a CPA or or be a marketer to, in, in some extent. I mean, you may be naturally good at it as part of the skills because you know your customers, you kind of know how to talk to them. That's great. But, you know, getting help in those areas is certainly uh, a good idea. I, th I think there's the... The small business CPA analogy is, is perfect, right? You, you you don't want to be a qualified CPA, mm -hmm. you know? And I would say you shouldn't be marketing your business, even if your business is marketing, mm -hmm. because you can't be objective, because right. you're, now, you're now on both sides of the counter. And the instant you become a vendor, the mm -hmm. instant you become a vendor, mm -hmm. your your view of the value exchange, the, the your view of the market mm -hmm. is is tainted because mm -hmm. you're looking at it from a sales perspective. You're no longer right. looking at it from a customer's perspective. Right. So you need to have somebody that much removed mm -hmm. who can come at it from a customer's perspective because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what you like. You know, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care if you don't like your website. All I care about is whether your customers like your website. Right. Right? Because it's the customers who are paying your bills. It's the customers who are paying your salary, right. who are paying your mortgage and paying your car payments. Right. Right? So those are the people you need to please. I don't care if your CEO doesn't like it because mm -hmm. he's not the one who's paying me. His right. customers are. Right. Well, but, you know, you've, you've, you've made a very, you know, pointed statement there. But, you know, the challenge is, um, you know, from my uh, observations from the marketing world, uh, is that it's still very ego driven. It's not customer driven, right? You have marketing agencies who are out to you know win awards and they talk about how many awards they win and everything else and how great their creative is and all that. It may not be effective, right? Because that's sort of like fourth thing down the line as opposed to you know that sort of thing. If if you're talking to an agency you want to engage, right? Let's say I'm you know you know you know G's cameras or G's digital backs or something. What are some of the things I should be talking to these agencies about to kind of evaluate them to make sure they're going to be effective? Very good question. I, I do feel sorry for any startup and small business shopping around for an agency partner at the moment because the industry, like, like many industries certainly, but certainly the one I know best and that's our industry, is full of sharks and snake oil sellers and what I call marketing bros mm -hmm. um, who seem to turn up on social media and crouching in front of Lamborghinis for some reason. I don't quite understand what that's all about. But <laughs> people, right? You know you know the sort of... Yeah, yeah. Lamborghinis, right? And they're usually th throwing up a gang sign of some sort. Right, exactly. They're doing, they're doing all the gang sign stuff, standing in front of a Lamborghini who their dad's borrowed from the dealership. It's not even theirs, right? Okay. So they're doing all of this stuff because they think, you know, for some reason, people think marketing is the next pyramid setting, get rich quick affiliate type scheme thing that's going on. And it, it drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the there are some telltale signs mm -hmm. to listen out for when you're having those mm -hmm. initial discovery conversations with potential agency partners. Right. What, one of them are the questions they ask. If, if, if you're doing most of the talking, mm -hmm. that's a bad sign. They should be asking a gazillion questions about right. your business. And they shouldn't be asking too much about the tactics that you're currently right. deploying. Right, right, right. It's, it, they should be finding out about your business, how long it's been around, what your customers look like, how that customer evolution has changed mm -hmm. over time, where you see the business going over the next... Sure year three years five you know what sure. maybe maybe you've got an exit plan right maybe you want to say yeah you ought to five have an years, exit plan. 10 years right you should have an well, exit not, plan. Not, 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 not necessarily there are plenty of people who just want lifestyle companies right yeah they they, they, they don't want you know to sell mm -hmm. they they just want a vehicle sure to 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 pay their bills and sure. keep them in standard standard of living and there's yeah, absolutely nothing because no no what, I, what no i was getting problem, to yeah. with 
with that was when I talked to my students about it, I said, you, know, you should know what you're, how you're going to get out. And that might be part of it, right? I'm just going to operate the business and pass it on to the family. That's a legit exit. I'm just Absolutely. Gonna shut the door. Right. That's okay. legit. Yeah. Or I'm going to sell it. So, I mean, but you should kind of have that in your mind, what your objective is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not, not everyone's going to go public, people. It's not happening. No, exactly. And very, and very few people do. I mean, just speak, just speak, speak to any VC, right? For every successful VC uh, IPO, there's probably 500 that crashed and burned, right? right. And VC, um, private equity companies, they're just playing the numbers because they only need to have mm -hmm. a couple of good ones right. in five years. Right mitigate all of their dumb bets yeah. that they've had all the rest of the time yeah if, yeah if, if i mean their hit percentage is so bad if they were a baseball player they'd be <laughs> they'd be uh, they'd be uh, out of the leagues right so so, getting, yeah. so so getting back to that uh discovery process Questions. with the yeah. marketing agents where they're evaluating them what if you are new let's say for example i'm just starting i've got this great idea for an app to make uh, photo cubes. I'm going to put photos on cubes and, you know, I'm going to produce. And I think, you know, I really have a gut feeling that there's, you know, 300,000 people who are going to pay me the first year for those cubes, but I don't really know, right? I'm more of a, I'm a, not necessarily a startup, but maybe just, you know, I, I, I don't have the customer base that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. What are some of the thoughts that you should talk about? Because most people go to, I need marketing, I need customers, I need blah, 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 but you may not have a, a history to share so what are your thoughts there well any any business has a has an idea of where their customers are right, right. okay very very basically they, they should <laughs> they should do yeah um but quite often like you like you mentioned just now it's it's a gut feeling rather mm -hmm. than anything that's that's tangible that's based on reality mm -hmm. if if somebody came to me and said i've got a really good feeling that you know photo cubes are going to be you know the n next big thing mm -hmm. i w i would i would question how they came to that decision because i need to buy into that right, right? yeah yeah and I, I need to understand that from a pragmatic perspective sure um i would want to do some kind of my own market validation within that mm -hmm. okay and it doesn't have to sort of cost a huge amounts of money you can do a sort of very small localized test um to a, approach the target ICP, sorry, um, ideal customer profile is sure. ICP, d d marketing lingo, I don't want to go down that road. I, <laughs> to and, and question a, a, a section of the possible target market for the product or service sure. to get their feedback, not just on the idea, but how they would see that idea actually being delivered, what the tangibles are, mm -hmm. and that, the, the whole buying experience for that. Is it a internet purchase type product or is it something that you would buy in store mm. or is it both um is it something that you would ship directly or is it something you would go through distributors and resellers mm -hmm. uh, what about support what about upselling um mm -hmm. what what do you do after the first 12 months is there something is is there any other recurrent revenue that you can depend on a service contract or something right, right. um and how to maybe adapt that base idea to fit into other particular verticals. Maybe there's a pro version that you can sell to agencies for, or I don't know, right? Yeah, right. To, yeah. Actually, to actually understand the, the full potential scope of that business, mm -hmm. which is something that maybe that business owner hasn't actually gone through. Right. Because they've, you know, they've they've just come up with that Edison IHA moment and they haven't actually sort of expanded it further out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from from there, it's then looking at putting together positioning and messaging, and the messaging will be different depending on those target audience groups. Yeah, mm -hmm. the way you message to an individual is going to be different to the way you message to an organisation. To to be very blunt, mm -hmm. uh, and only once you've come through all of that, and obviously part of that is looking at the business model. Okay, so what's the end sell? What's the profit on that end sell? Right. What numbers do you need to hit in the first 12, 24, 36 months of trading? So right. how many units are we selling? And then we have to work out, okay, so if we're using, for instance, if we're using digital advertising, which doesn't mean that we are, because there are plenty of other ways to advertise without using digital mediums, right? Media, mm -hmm. right? But if we are, we need to work out what the cost per acquisition is, right? Mm -hmm. So 
how many eyeballs do we need to show your product to mm. to get interest? And out of those, once we get enough interest, how many interested parties, on average, mm. need to see it to the point of getting a conversion? Right. That's a huge issue right now because, I mean, Absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm sure. hearing from – like people in the photo business, the online photo business, right? They may have a site or an app or something. You know, it can toss sixteen, eighteen dollars to just get a get a customer. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely. That's not inexpensive when you think about it. When the old days, if you could just send out a postcard and and get customers. Well, you know, I I think there's 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 lots of other things. There's lots of other moving parts involved with that, right? Sure. Here. Um, and there's there's targeting, there's personalization, and mm -hmm. you know. You know, there's there's still too many people out there who think you know if we build it they will come. Sure. Unfortunately, right? And th that whole idea of targeting doesn't seem to be nobody spends much time on that sort of stuff mm -hmm. beyond whatever the parameters are within a digital advertising mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. So you know you may be using Google Ads or Facebook, Instagram advertising, and you've got various um, customer uh, criteria for creating targeted profiles. Sure. But, but you'll do that, but then you won't change the creative accordingly. Right. And you may not even be targeting using the right medium. Mm -hmm. Right. Just, you know, for a ludicrous example, mm -hmm. okay, um, and it's a sweeping generalization. Sure. If, if you were targeting... 85 year old retired pastors mm -hmm. it's probably not a good idea to use tiktok mm -hmm. right i think i can safely say that yeah. i don't think there are too many 85 year old retired pastors using tiktok my mm -hmm. gut feeling mm -hmm. right and yet there are plenty of people with marketing in their job title which will look at these channels as being ubiquitous and the, the process of going through the creation of the target audience profile and the media is the same. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And they are, they are very, very different vehicles, each with their own pluses and minuses. And right. unless you actually understand the vagarities and the idiosyncrasies of the particular channels, what work and what doesn't work. Sure. You're basically flying blind. And as an agency, you're, you're playing with your client's money. Mm -hmm. Right. And speaking of playing with client's money, uh, one of the things I've noticed a lot of um, is on certain media types, whether it's, uh, you know, short videos or whatever, there's almost like a visual, like a trend. Somebody does something and then other people start copying it. Like, I think the classic example that I comes to mind while we were talking was, remember, remember when Dollar Shave Club came out? And the guy did the video, the CEO did the video of walking through the warehouse and he did various antics, but he was talking about, you know, the product and the service. And the, this is why they can do it for, a, you know, send you a, a, a razor blade for a dollar, right? But it was cute. And I swear for the next six months, all I saw were, were knockoffs of that. And the agencies probably thought, this is great because people kind of saw that. They like that. We can do that, too. What do you, I mean, just, just that, that to me is because we're going to get to bad marketing at a point. I think that is the epitome of bad marketing is, is copycat because it's trendy. Coke in tobacco grad filters. Okay. Back in the seventies, there was a square acetate filter system called mm -hmm. Coke in K O C O K I N. Yep. Right. Well, Kong, they were French actually. Right. For a while. Every landscape photograph you could see used a graduated tobacco filter on the sky, <laughs> right? Okay. Chocolate box photos, right? right. And Coking sold a ton of um, tobacco grad filters, yeah. right? And any, anything that's novel mm -hmm. and, 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 gen, and generates um, a positive emotional response is going to be copied. It's like, I, you know, any ideas, right? Photo right. books, right? Right mm -hmm. at the beginning, there was Apple and Google doing photo books. Now you've got third-party photo book software and mm -hmm. third parties creating photo books mm -hmm. uh, with nice web-to-friend interfaces and, and, you know, doing very well out of it, right? It's a, it's a Me Too product. I mean, okay, there may be sort of, um, you know, minor differences in terms of uh, 
uh, maybe Paper. quality or in terms of um, mm -hmm. turnaround or pricing or you know whatever else. But at the end of the day, photo book, right? It's photo book. So there, 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 there's always there's always going to be copycats. The issue is for the layperson, the average um, person who's subject to that communication. What do they think of when they see your copycat piece of content? It's think of the original. For example, and the, all right, at Samsung and Apple. Mm. Okay, Samsung's TV ads are well, not just Samsung. Pretty much any tele uh, non-Apple phone TV ads are very Apple-esque mm -hmm. in 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 their in their art direction. Uh, and in their editing, right? So it make it make it, it doesn't make you think of Samsung. Mm -hmm. It makes you think of Apple, right? Right. So you know, is, is that the best way of Samsung using their budget, or is it better to actually come up with a new type of idea, a new type of expression of the value they're creating with them? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking Samsung's phones or mm -hmm. tablets or t telephones or or um, Wash, uh, washer dryers or whatever else they do because I mean there's a huge company so <laughs> yeah, they make almost everything. everything right but but if if you're if you're aping your competitor mm -hmm. your audience is thinking of them instead of you mm -hmm. so what you need to be is is differentiated and a dist if possible distinctive right in the ter in the ways that you choose to articulate your value, which is as certainly is about features, mm -hmm. but it's also about use cases and it's also about execution, sure. art direction, color palettes, photography, video, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that the only the, the only way people can see a piece of creative for your product, they can only think of you. They can't think of anybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. I mean, I mean, one, I mean, one of the challenges that I reinforce about marketing is that, you know, it's a discipline like almost anything else. It's not just the creative side. It's a discipline in the sense that you have to say no a lot. Strategy is about saying is about what you say no to more than what you say yes to. And, and you're right. And that's the, the problem is, and, you know, we're talking about CPAs earlier on, right? You cannot be a qualified accountant without passing an exam. You can't be a lawyer unless you pass the bar, right? Mm -hmm. You in, uh, you can't go into a hospital. Nobody will allow you to cut somebody open unless you have a medical degree. And yet, anybody and his dog can be a marketer, right? <laughs> you buy and yourself they are. A <laughs> and they are. You buy yourself a laptop, <laughs> right? A creative cloud subscription, and you sit down at a Starbucks with a flat white, and you think you're a marketer. Yeah. Right? right. This is the problem. The barrier to entry is non-existent. Mm -hmm. And so what you have are people who haven't got a friggin' clue what marketing is. They think mark they conflate marketing with promotion or mm -hmm. communications. Right. They have no idea about um, call or quant analysis, segmentation, targeting, positioning. They don't know anything about market market orientation. They don't know they don't know what they don't know, to be honest, Gary. And right. it's it's very frustrating because somebody like me and there's plenty more of my peers who are in the same position. We are the ones who have to pick up the pieces right. because we are the ones where small small business owners come to us and say, "You know what? I believe the BS by this particular company, and I'm out. I'm not in substantial amount of money. What what can we do? Mm -hmm. Right? So not only does that you know, is that not a nice conversation to have, but it also it also taints the entire industry. Mm -hmm. Right, because you know people sort of look there. Oh, marketer! All right, well, do we? What, do you stand in front of Lamborghinis? Is that what you do? Is that what you call <laughs> or, you, or you just shoot TikToks all day? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and and and, and that is a, it's it's a real issue because it's deception. There's no other word for it. Mm -hmm. You know, right. there's 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 no regulation. Right, people can get into this without any experience, mm -hmm. without any education, mm -hmm. and call themselves a marketer. Because you know, what 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 is a marketer? What does it mean? You know, mm -hmm. creating Facebook ads, does that make you a marketer? Right. Just designing a website, does that make you a marketer? Right. Okay, what, what is the definition? There isn't a definition, right? Right. Yeah, because it can be almost anything. It and, can be almost anything, exactly. Right. Yeah. And therefore, it means nothing. And therefore, it means nothing. And that's that, that 
in essence, is you, you know I've just described pretty much my day every day, Gary. That's that's <laughs> that's what I have to go through, and I you know I speak to business owners every single day, right? And they're usually pleasantly surprised and refreshed when the first thing out of my mouth isn't a tactic, mm, right? Right. We don't start talking you know, before we've even, <clears throat> you know, exchange finished exchanging pleasantries. We're talking about mm -hmm. um, Facebook ads, or we're talking about new websites. And it's like, no, 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 no. Let's talk about your business, right? Okay, what what are you trying to achieve? All right, what, what's your average customer order value? What's your recurrent revenue per mm -hmm. customer? How profit? Do you know your top twenty most profitable customers? Why mm -hmm. are they more profitable than the bottom mm -hmm. than the bottom twenty? And if you don't know, what are you going to do to find out about them? Right. Because, yeah. because I, I, you know, I think you know, you're talking about strategy, which is super important. And what I've discovered, especially in my segment, right? You get like photo retailers, uh, labs, people like that. They're just buried in production, right? They, I mean, in terms of, I need to get this thing done out the door or whatever, and they don't have time to think about strategy, right? And so, ta talking to those people who could benefit from better marketing, but they seem to be very, very daunted when they are approached the idea that hey i need to work on strategy i need to think about that as opposed to hey my print my 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 print tech didn't show up today so i've got to sit at the printer all day right they're worried about those those issues so what are some of the things like somebody who is in that position what are some of the things that they could do to kind of jumpstart that process because it, it's 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 not an easy fix for one thing but it's also something that you need to start. And so where do you start? It's it's a very difficult conversation to have for the vast majority of business owners. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason why I think is the in, in, entrepren, entrepreneurial nature of the average business owner. And I mentioned it before. Strategy is as much what you say no to Right. as what you actually say yes to is actually it's more about what you say no to right and the entrepreneur mindset is anti saying no right you want right? to say yes to everything you want to say yes to absolutely everything okay? exactly so they're nailing somebody down on strategy and saying okay who are we mm -hmm. what do we sell who do we serve right why does it matter it's basic marketing questions by by actually putting sticks in the ground about these particular ideals these these pillars of what the business is by inference it says what the business isn't right at which point the business owner starts backpedaling hugely saying oh wait 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 but yeah we, that doesn't mean to say that we're not going to go after this type of business and i say yes it does mm -hmm. right, right? It does mean saying no to that type of business. Mm -hmm. Yes, but there's a huge opportunity in that side. Of business. Then start another business, right? Serving that customer profile, right? Just this week, it was announced. Uh, Apple has said no to making an electric vehicle. Right. Right. You know they were going to. They were spent. Well, I don't know. Ten years on Project Titan. I'm doing air quotes for for those who can't see. And, you know, they thought they were going to, you know, people thought they were going to disrupt. That's my my least favorite word. They were going to disrupt the market. But clearly, they realized, you know, they had to say no to that. And this is Apple, probably one of the most successful companies in the in the world, which you would think would um, would could do anything they want. But actually, Apple is a, is a very strategic and a very disciplined company because they say no to a lot of things that they could be in, that they're not. Firstly, Apple have neither confirmed or denied the existence. Oh, yes, of that's true. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So we're, what we're talking about is water, water cooler gossip. Right. Okay. Right. That's good, nice, nice gossip, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Right. But it is no more than gossip. Right. And I say that because um, in my previous job, I worked quite closely with Apple. Okay. Um, been to Cupertino many times, met Steve Jobs twice. Mm-hmm. Um, I, well, in, in those days, I knew a little bit about how things worked within the organization. Obviously I wasn't privy to very much, you know, right. Confidential stuff, but in, t in terms of process and in terms of, um, teams, small teams working on particular 
um, products, mm-hmm. it is very strategic. In the the, and I, I know I don't want this to be a sort of a dissection of uh, of Apple's business model. Sure. But, you know, the, the the Tim Cook Apple is a very different animal, which is primarily driven driven uh, driven by uh, profit centers and profit mm-hmm. making. Sure. Um, as a, over and above anything that I would call innovation. Sure. Um, but I, as I say, I don't. I don't want to go down that road because I'm sure there are plenty of Apple fanboys and fangirls out there. Well, I don't know, mind. I don't mind who, pissing them off. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, I. I need all the friends I can get, Gary. So I'm not going to piss <laughs> anybody off. No, but but, um, but I guess I want to use them as an example because they are. No, well in known. terms of strategy, you're absolutely right. Okay, it's about it's about saying what you're not going to do, what not right. what you are going to do, and that the hardest thing is to nail somebody down, to accept that, to recognize that as the only way forward. Mm-hmm. You, know, you cannot be all things to all people. People need to. People are looking to pigeonhole you, mm-hmm. and you should let them pigeonhole you. Mm-hmm. Oh, X Y Z company, yeah, they're the guys who do that. Right. That's what you want to be. That's what you want to be known for. Okay. That's interesting. Just let yourself be pigeonholed. Yes. Because some people would think that's a bad thing. Well, um, look look, look at the Fortune 500, and uh, there mm-hmm. are probably 90% of the companies in the Fortune 500 are companies that you can pigeonhole. Right. Right? They, ha- they have a very clear uh, articulation of their value. Mm-hmm. What we do is X. Mm-hmm. And and we do it very well, and mm-hmm. maybe the best in the world at it. When I have my discussion on branding with my entrepreneurship students, that's one thing I ask them: What is a brand? And they always say it's a swoosh, it's a you know a logo. Yeah, it's and, a I logo. Said, no. and I said, no, it's what the customer thinks of you. That's right. your brand. Jeff Bezos says mm. a brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Right. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Uh, but again, I guess at this point, because you, cause you really don't have any, con- I mean, you have control over your business process and you have a control over a lot of things, but you don't really control what people think of you. Customers are in control of your brand. Right. Your brand is what customers say about you. Right. Right. Your, Which your, is your why reviews your... and things are super important now. Right. You, 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 you can influence the perception, but ultimately mm-hmm. it's, it's uh, the brand is controlled by your customer. Right. And and it's like it's like a tree. It takes a long time to grow, right. and a very 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 short time to to cut down. That's interesting. So I not, I had not thought of it that way. So when you talk about like when you get into these situations where people come to your business and they've said we've had a bad experience with X Y Z marketing agency. You know they had us shoot a bunch of tin cocks in front of a Lambo, and our CEO is fifty years old, and it was not working. But it won them an award, so that's great, right? So, and and the sad thing is, in the marketplace, they've already kind of polluted customer perception. So, how do you work with that, where someone may have made some mistakes in marketing that are, are maybe not uh, in line with what their brand value or proposition actually is? What do you do in that situation? It's very, very difficult. Um, road forward, to be honest, Gary, and there, there's no there's no easy answers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a it's a long, uh, drawn out, humbling process. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it starts at the very beginning. Um, it it in extreme circumstances, obviously, it depends on the particular in, instance. It, it it can mean um, a, a total review of everything customer facing in terms of the distinctive mm-hmm. brand assets that have been built up for per, perhaps years. We've just completed something with a a company which is 25 years old. Mm-hmm. And for various reasons, um, after after doing a, a deep dive in terms of uh, customer sure. um, qualitative analysis, the only real way forward was a total ground up rebuild of that of that company. 25 mm-hmm. year old company starting mm-hmm. start basically starting, starting from scratch on the face of it looking like a brand new company mm-hmm. okay you know they, certainly they've got sort of some some history to that mm-hmm. um there's there's no there's no recipe there's no hard you know hard and fast f- fail safe answers to to get you out of that 
it, it, it is very much dependent on the particular situation of that organisation and the business results that they're looking to get and the budget they've got available, obviously. Sure, yeah. Because um, exactly. all of these things, are, the, the way I refer to it is a, is a three-legged stool, right? Mm-hmm. So you have, you have the business result that you're looking to achieve, the time you have available to achieve it, and the budget that you can apportion mm-hmm. to the efforts, right? And usually what happens is at least one of those legs come up short. Mm-hmm. I'll leave you to guess which one that may be, right? <laughs> right. And right. then it's usually uh, the job of people like me to fit a quart into a pint pot, you know, mm-hmm. to actually sharpen our pencil and make the whole thing work. It's mm-hmm. People underestimate how much budget is required to do a good job at stuff, right? Because they see, oh, marketing automation and uh, AI and this and that. It's all, you know, press a button and stuff comes vomiting out the other end. And it's like vomiting is the right word because it yeah. is actual vomit, most yeah. 90% of it. Yeah. Right? You know, uh, and the the skill is actually finding out, finding the gold from the dirt, isn't it? Right, yeah. And uh, that's 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 what really is 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 missing so so so, yeah. so you mentioned something earlier about ai and technology and i want to touch on that because there's a lot of you know, vc money as you said private equity money going into these you know what in our industry we call the generative ai models right where you can create an image just by typing in a prompt right and there's a lot of work being done in the advertising world uh, about that where for example uh you know, based on the demographics of the viewer, the graphic on the ad may change, right? If I'm a if I'm a young person, I'm looking at polo shirts, I'm going to see a younger, uh, you know, maybe somebody, you know, my ethnicity or something like that. And what do you think about that? Do you think that is a good application of that technology to try and reflect the reflect the viewer? In that, what I mean, I'm just curious what your thoughts are because it's relatively new and it's getting a lot of attention. But you know, it's like 3D TV. Is it really going to do make a difference? Well, I th- well, the technology is new, mm-hmm. but the idea behind it is far from new. Just yeah. like 3D TV, right? Mm-hmm. Go back to Vincent Price and the House of Wax in 1955. Right, right? that was 3D. Mm-hmm. Right, you had to have wear, wear those funky uh, red and green glasses. Right, and go to the cinema. Right, and that was that. That was three D. Right, the idea of of marketers or advertisers targeting specific audience groups mm-hmm. on their creative mm-hmm. is pretty much as old as advertising. Mm-hmm. Right, that, there's there's nothing new about that. What is new mm-hmm. is the technology to get there. Right? right, and and the speed of production. Right, that 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 whole aspect is 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 new. Now, if the creative is um, relevant and generates a positive emotional response to the point of making purchase, then that's the idea of advertising. Great. Right. My issue is that we've sacrificed better mm-hmm. for fast. Okay. Right? So we're creating noise, more and more of it, Mm-hmm. But with less and less signal. Right. Right. So uh, generative AI models, LLMs doing things like uh, imagery, great. Um, or even movies, Sora, the new thing that OpenAI have done. I don't know if you saw the, the, the videos that have been mm. flying around social media the last couple of weeks. All very well and good. But think of that in the professional aspect, in an agency aspect. So you, you, you create something in one of these um, uh, photo AI engines. And supposing it's um, three puppies, okay, mm-hmm. on on a street lit, lit at night, um, and it creates that image, and you say, okay, that's that the look, the feel, the cropping, the everything is absolutely perfect. But actually, one of those puppies, instead of it being a Labrador, I want it to be an Irish Setter. Mm-hmm. What happens? It generates a whole new image, right? That has probably very little to do with the image that it just created. Right, exactly. So there's, 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 there's no experiment, there's no iteration going on. Right. It's starting from scratch each time. Right. It doesn't learn from what it just did. Right. Right? And so you, you, you're getting more and more frustrated, and over time, your iteration is getting further and further away from the 
in inverted commas, brief, mm -hmm. which is what you needed to create in the first place, looking right. like, a, you know, you'd have a layout pad maybe sketched out of this, what, what type of the image was. So what we've got is now we're getting to the point of that'll do, it's close enough right. to what we had in our mind or what the art director briefed us to actually create for the ad. Mm -hmm. But the AI is driving that. Mm -hmm. We're no longer driving that. No, in, if you think about things like product shots or modeling or even video, mm -hmm. okay, in, 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 the, in, the, in the real world and the way most production is done today, um, especially when there's montage stuff, is that you have 3D animation models rendered within live action, right? right. So there's geometry within, within the shot, which mm -hmm. doesn't exist in an AI model. Right. Right. So you can't tweak the model's orientation on the X, Y, or Z axis within right. the, the frame, it has to go off and start all over again. Right. So, so that iteration, that, that tweaking, that art direction, that video direction, isn't mm -hmm. there yet. Right. Now, of course, like all of these things, and probably it's just time. Right. right? It'll happen it's, eventually. You know, it's, it's, it's like uh, the way that uh, these models try to handle things like fingers and arms. They just, they just look like bunches of sausages, don't they? They just look like weird, yeah. right? right? But it's, 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 it's early days. It'll, it'll probably get there. Right. But, it, but we're, it, what, are we, what are we using it for? Is it to create more low-quality stuff faster? Well, I think that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's or, exactly you know, or, what's happening. Or, or is it supposed to be to be able to create really awesome stuff right faster better right. and with a, a greater result right but that, i think it's more of the the, the one with the former yes <laughs> <laughs> look at this great thing i can do 17 iterations of this and like you said exactly. it's, it's uh it is i mean like i said it's it's i think it's going to be refined certainly to a point you know where the fingers don't look like sausages and you know it will be because it does have sort of that dead eye look um yes. and certain yeah. things and i think especially for text right if you want to use ai to generate text absolutely it's yeah. it's it's crazy i mean i i i i i posted them on my personal facebook the other day where um i get subscribed to some newsletters and they're clearly written by ai it's about my you know uh, the detroit lions and, and there was literally this mm -hmm. article about how re-signing the third string quarterback was going to be key to them winning the super bowl and it was just so enthusiastic <laughs> you know and it was just like oh my you know it was just the way it was written you could just tell no human being wrote this it was just clear that it was you know ai and it's just some sort of tool they were using to just populate this thing and just send it out to hopefully maybe i'll click on it and get an ad in there but it'll get better, obviously. Tools get better over time. I mean, remember the absolutely. early remember the early Photoshop you were mentioning, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, sure. Yeah, I mean, I started using Photoshop before they had layers. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Right? We didn't have layers in Photoshop two. Right. I, I came with three, three point I think, is when layers came. Well, now you're dating yourself. <laughs> and you know, as we kind of draw to a conclusion here, just um, you know, do you think marketing? is in a crisis in a way because um like you said the barrier to entry is so low and yet so much damage can be done now in a lot of ways right i mean we've all seen um you know cases where you know uh, a message gets out it's not it's not it's just sort of a you know hey somebody somebody the intern or whoever used put something on the LinkedIn post or the Instagram post or whatever, and it was not brand consistent and there was actually a backlash to it. So what is your, you know, perception is the state of marketing today? Crisis is not too strong a word. I don't think Gary. Okay. Um, I, th I think it's absolutely right. I th and I, th I think there's two reasons, well, at least two reasons, probably more than two reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, of why marketing is in crisis, which are quite different in of themselves, mm -hmm. but are nonetheless connected. And I think number one is that marketing is is in crisis because I firmly believe this, that marketing is ideologically disliked in the higher echelons of business. Mm -hmm. and, sure. that, and the result is that we do effective marketing 
well, effective marketing doesn't happen. We do efficient marketing instead of effective marketing. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. The C-suite, CEOs, CFOs, COOs, have an inherent distrust in marketing, mm -hmm. I think, consciously or unconsciously, because it goes against the way they think. Mm -hmm. It goes against the sequential, rational thought processes mm -hmm. that accountants, finance people, economists love so much, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because if you look at business, right, much of business is founded under, you could call it like an engineering model. Sure, okay? exactly. Most, most management consultants, for example, come from an engineering type background. Right. Okay. In fact, you could even look and say that economics is based on an engineering model because it looks at economies and markets as though they mm -hmm. operate under Newtonian rules, mm -hmm. right? One plus one always equals two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, most companies start with engineering. Absolutely. In some form. Right. And the, the, the thing is, in pretty much every other area of business, mm -hmm. That, that, that business unit is overwhelmingly driven by rational, logic-based thinking. Sure. It's about trying to find ways to reduce costs, reduce effort, mm -hmm. increase productivity, increase efficiency, and all the rest of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. But what's happening now is that that line of thinking is being extrapolated into marketing mm -hmm. with the goal of reducing effort and cost by mechanizing the process. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, where in manufacturing, you know, if you're supposing you're making widgets, right? Right. Un unless you reduce the cost so that the widget no longer has a, is no longer working, right? Right. Um, reducing the cost of marketing reduces its effectiveness mm -hmm. because the arbiters that we see as judging effectiveness are more than its constituent parts. Let me explain. So... If you're, if you're thinking about a business process that's based on rationality and logic, mm -hmm. it presupposes a fixed and rational target. Right. That always behaves in a certain way under certain conditions. Right. The problem with marketing is that our target are human beings. Mm -hmm. And human beings are not rational objects. Right. They aren't machines that right. always think or do something in the same way. Mm -hmm. They, right. they right. don't, we don't behave logically. We mm -hmm. don't behave rationally, which means effective marketing involves, I don't want to use the term out of the box thinking, but it, and essentially it's creative experimentation. It's stuff which finance people see as being superficial mm -hmm. and right. irrational. Right. Well, right. that was the word I was actually going to use to interject was ir irrational. That's exactly right. the word. Absolutely. So that's number one, that there's, there's a, there's a fundamental disconnect mm -hmm. between every other area of the business and marketing. Mm. Okay. Because firstly, to, to, to get to that, that ultimate sweet spot of effectiveness requires exper experimentation and what a finance person would deem as being waste. Right. Okay. But that's the only way that we can get to that point. Right. That's number one. The second reason why I think marketing is in crisis, and it's related to the first, because the people who are hiring marketers don't know what marketing is. Right. And the people they're hiring don't know what marketing is. Right. They think marketing is promotions. Right. They think marketing is doing a dance on TikTok. Right. They think marketing is posting an ad on Facebook. Right. Okay. You know, promotion is part of marketing, sure, but it's a tiny percentage of a tiny percentage of what marketing is actually concerned with. Right. If you think of it as a primary business function. I had a question there because because he kind of tapped on something that I, that I think is interesting. Because I see a okay. lot where you see an executive C-suite, right, where they take there's a vice president of sales and marketing. Usually, they try and join those two together. Yeah. Uh, why? Why do you think they do that, and why do, And what are your thoughts on the effectiveness of that? Usually, it's because the person, uh, and, and also the person who's who's sales and marketing, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. has come from a sales background. He's never come from a marketing background, has he? Right. It's no. always a salesperson who thinks they can do marketing, never the other way around. Right. Yeah, we yeah. notice that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, exactly. That's why I asked the question. <laughs> right. And the reason is because a sales guy is only ever looking at the next 90 days. Right. The marketer is looking further down the road. Right. Right. I, I, I used to use the analogy of car headlights. You know, you've got dipped headlights and you've got full headlights. Mm-hmm. Right? So dipped headlights allow you to see the next 20, 30 feet. Mm-hmm. Right? And once once you've got nobody, you know, in front of you and you can, you're driving the night and you can put the full headlights, you can, you can see like a few hundred yards right. ahead. Right? That's the difference between sales and marketing. Sales is concerned with what can I close business in the next 30, 60, 90? Mm-hmm. Because based upon that, it knows whether I've got a job. Right. In most cases, right? Marketing's looking further down the road. Mm-hmm. Marketing's looking at what do we need to do today to keep that funnel filled mm-hmm. in six months, in three years, in 10 mm-hmm. years' time? Where mm-hmm. do we need to start making our investments, our planning? our distribution, our pricing, our innovation, or whatever else. So you wouldn't recommend those people being the same person, is what you're saying? They cannot be the same person, because they, they their goals are different. Mm-hmm. Their goals right. are totally different. And the reason why it's always the salesperson who thinks they can become the marketer, it's a poach, it's a, it's the poacher becoming gamekeeper, right? Mm-hmm. They're, 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 they're controlling both sides. The reason why they're doing that is because they've had run-ins with marketing throughout their professional lives where marketing right. hasn't given them what they want. Right. Right. Because they marketing can't give them what they want. Right. Because marketing's looking further down the road. Because they're the ones who say no. Because <laughs> they're the ones who say no. Because marketing... And salespeople don't like to hear no. They like to right. hear yes. They just, no, salespeople like to hear when. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it's, I, it always sort of amuses me that these sales and marketing people mm-hmm. are always promoted salespeople. Mm-hmm. Right. Marketers don't think they're salespeople. Now, right. the best marketers may have been salespeople, because right. I don't think you can be, do, be a marketer unless you've had sales experience. Right. Even, I mean, even like retail. I mean, you could be waiting tables, mm-hmm. right? But that face-to-face human connection sales experience, mm-hmm. I, there's no book or course that you can do Right. to get that, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Um, but most marketers don't pretend to think of them as being salespeople. Right. Not right. at all. But salespeople think, that, well, everybody thinks they can be marketers, right? Right. Oh, exactly. That's oh, how could it be? Come on. Well, they want to be an influencer, right? Influencer, I mean, that's, yes. <laughs> that's the thing. I think it's more like effluencer, isn't yeah, it? Well, think, well, that's the whole thing is I thought, I, I've seen some backlash with, with people responding to influencers because it's like, you realize that you're the influencer isn't promoting the brand. They're promoting them. They're using the brand to promote themselves. So again, influencers have been around since the fifties. Oh, er, yeah, wait, maybe even earlier. Yeah, exactly. Right? When 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 TV ads were live, mm-hmm. right? they weren't recorded. Right. right? Yeah. Uh, these oh, people yeah. influencers they would have. I mean, you had you know you had. Uh, no, but just look at a lot of the early cigarette manufacturing or marketing. Yeah, back. Laramie. Yeah, and that's all that was. Right. Very yeah. cool. Well, listen, G, it's been great talking to you. If people want to connect with you and learn more about the crazy things you're espousing, how do they reach out to you? They can go to hell, Gary. No, 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 no. That's not true. No, it's not true. Because you're going to say no. You're going to say no. I'm going to say no because I'm all about strategy. No, if 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 any of my inane ramblings has made sense to anybody and they want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm sure you can post my LinkedIn I will a link it. on the show notes. That's probably the best way to get hold of me. I'm on various other... Um, social networks Mm -hmm. including tiktok but i promise you i do not dance um but linkedin is the one i use most often i don't touch twitter anymore since it became a dumpster fire for fascists but (laughs) i'm otherwise i'm pretty much on everything else awesome well listen it's been a wonderful talking to you i i I hope we connect again in the future and uh best wishes thank you so much thanks for having me i really enjoyed it thank you for listening to the dead pixel society podcast Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.